this conference um, inspired me. I give a lot of talks where at the very beginning I give a very short, uh, short overview of the levels of Husserl's phenomenology as I interpret them. Um, and then at the end of whatever sort of intense technical work I do with Husserl, uh, then I sort of point and say, there's really some cool applications we can do with this. And I realized that at this conference I should actually make that the paper, the, the stuff that I actually usually only sort of point to uh, before and after a talk. So um, this is partly due to multiple conversations I've had with uh, Thomas Fuchs, uh, where I've been telling him about these things and promising I would do it. So I'm actually doing it this time. Uh, so to begin, uh, Husserl scholars and those who work with Husserl's phenomenology are usually familiar with the fact that there are several levels of experience, such as the level where objects are constituted as whole unities, as seen in Ideas 1, with which most people are familiar, as opposed to the intersubjective inter levels, as seen most famously in the Cartesian meditations. My argument here is, first, that there are several such levels of experience, and that they are much more systematically in place for Husserl than might first appear. These levels are evident especially in his middle and late periods, and they can be found either implicitly or explicitly in a multitude of published and unpublished works by Husserl. If we work carefully through these different levels, moreover, I believe that we must also recognize the following. Husserl's conclusions drawn at one level of experience do not necessarily apply to all the other levels. While some claims he makes are universal claims, other claims are specific to the level of experience and should not be transferred to our experiences at other levels. In this way, where Husserl sometimes appears to be contradicting himself or equivocating on a set of terms, we will find instead that he is actually carrying out analyses on different levels that call for different conclusions. So this last point is actually a bit of an argument within Husserl scholarship where you might find someone arguing that Husserl is contradicting himself or equivocating on a specific term. And my argument is that most often he's actually not equivocating, but rather he's shifted to another level and he's doing new analyses which now call for different types of conclusions. My paper will proceed as follows. First, I will provide an overview of these levels with a brief explanation of each. Then I will apply these levels to the condition of eating disorders, demonstrating how a recognition of phenomenological levels of experience can assist not only in understanding them generally, but also in diagnosis, therapeutic analysis, and phenomenological description. So there are lots of examples I've been thinking through. I chose eating disorders because I've done some work on that before. And then I was very pleased as I was reviewing the topics of various talks at this conference that multiple people are dealing with different types of eating disorders. Uh, and so hopefully this will actually um, fit in and weave in with a lot of other talks at the conference. My goal is to develop a relatively solid understanding of each of these levels, as well as how they and the conclusions drawn while carrying out analyses within them do and do not relate to one another. In addition, I wish to demonstrate how these levels indicate different aspects of embodiment and temporality. So allow me to describe these levels briefly in order to provide an overview. The levels from highest to lowest, to use Husserl's terms, are roughly as follows. At the highest level, we find intersubjective community which is the historical intergenerational stratum of meaning, or alternately an abstract understanding of numerous possible subjects. So I abbreviate that as IS2. Ah, wrong. There. You can find that. This level addresses the meanings that develop within a culture, the transition from one generation to another, and that surface through analyses of history, society, and language. We find Husserl discussing this level most coherently in his later work on the crisis of European sciences, although he also touches upon this level on the latter half of his fifth Cartesian meditation and in many of his mans manuscripts on intersubjectivity. So many people, when they're reading the fifth Cartesian meditation by Husserl, only read a few sections where he's talking about um, my, the hypothetical situation where another person appears before me or walks up to me. 
And people usually read that analysis and stop, but the whole second half of the fifth Cartesian meditation, he's actually talking about intersubjective community. Um, he talks about communities and history uh, and things like that. At the next level down, we encounter the interpersonal intersubjective level, abbreviated as IS-1. This level describes our interaction with other subjects through empathy, through our intersubjective constitution of the world as objective, also addressed, which is also addressed at the higher level of IS-2 in a more abstract way, and how our own bodies gain their objective sense through the perception of others. This work is carried out most famously in the first part of Husserl's Fifth Cartesian Meditations, but it is also arguably addressed in more detail in his ideas too. So the interesting thing about uh, the IS-1 and the IS-2 is sometimes it looks like Husserl talks about a first level, which is concrete others, and then a pure level that looks like a more intergenerational part. But if you look at different texts, there's actually a concrete and a pure level at the interpersonal level and a concrete and a pure level uh, aspects on the uh, level of, of intergenerational um, intersubjectivity. The next level is the most common understanding of Husserl's phenomenology, and it is also his primary entry into many of his own analyses. This is the level of individual meaning constitution. Although much constitutive activity it here is actually passive in addition to active, I will refer to this as the level of active constitution, or AC. It is here that we take up consciousness's active meaning constitution and the meaningful contents with which it is engaged. Husserl's analyses at this level describe the structures of consciousness required for meaning constitution, such as noesis and noema, and he focuses on the individual subject and her constitution of experience, of experienced objects as unities. Ideas 1 is a text best known for Husserl's extensive analysis in this area. So most people, at least in the United States, if they have an introduction to Husserl, they're going to read Ideas 1. Um, some misunderstandings of Husserl have been based on the fact that some people only read Ideas 1 and not much else. I don't think in Europe that is much of a problem as it is in the United States. Um, but this is one way, this is how Husserl often enters into his phenomenology, but it's clear that if you read multiple texts, he's actually moving well beyond that level. The next layer down is more nebulous, as it is the level of passive synthesis. This layer addresses what is passively in play, such as associations between similar things, habituations of constitution and decisions, sedimentations of memories, etc. However, we should note that for Husserl, passive does not mean inactive, but rather the synthetic work done by consciousness that goes unnoticed, while consciousness is engaged in direct experiences. This includes embodied habits, as well as tendencies to constitute certain sets of data in one way rather than another. So we have habits of constitution, we also have embodied habits, we have decisions that we make that become part of us. All of this is understood by Husserl through passive, in, uh, passive synthesis. Conversely, as I mentioned earlier, what is active for Husserl is not necessarily what is more energetically in play, but rather what is in awareness for consciousness, that toward which my attention is directed. So Husserl changes the meanings of active and passive in a certain way or uses them differently where active really means what's in the forefront of my consciousness, what I'm really paying attention to, and passive does not mean inactive but actually means it's in the background of my consciousness or what consciousness is sort of doing all the time. So the passive synthesis is sort of the machinery of consciousness and the act of consciousness is what consciousness is aware of what it's doing. The layer of passive synthesis, this background of consciousness, requires analyses not only of the structures of consciousness, but also of the contents of consciousness and their interplay with one another. These analyses, analyses are most famously published in the collection of Husserl's lectures on the analyses concerned of pa concerning passive and active synthesis, but they can be found throughout his work, especially beginning in his middle period. Finally, the lowest level of experience is that of the flow of primordial material, often referred to as the hyletic flow. This flow is a layer of rudimentary sensory experience that underlies our acts of perception. Husserl refers to this hyletic flow already in Ideas 1, but in his lectures on passive synthesis and in his later manuscripts, we see much more attention directed toward this area.
And um, I'm planning on working on this a little bit more. I mean, the highlighted flow is highly problematic and highly interesting uh, in Husserl's work. Um, I would argue, um, and I have textual evidence that I'm not doing here, um, that Husserl actually identifies multiple levels even within the highlighted flow. So we sort of have the pure uh, sensory flow, but then we also have um, what he would call primordial associations, in German, so Ur-Assoziationen. Um, and so already at the level of the hyaletic flow, we have um, groupings of um, appearing sensations that kind of come together already. So consciousness is already passively doing work at the level of the hyaletic flow. We also have the first moment of temporality happening at this level. So there's all sorts of things. This is a very uh, um, exciting area, but it's also... Um, uh, also very hypothetical, right? So Husserl is really kind of um, trying to work through a lot of things here. As indicated, Husserl often focuses on only one level at, in a specific text or set of analyses. So I would say ideas one is really just at the level of active constitution. However, in some writings, as those addressing passive, such as those addressing passive synthesis, he passes through several levels, often beginning at the level of active meaning constitution, then moving down through the intermediate level of passive synthesis, and finally arriving down at the primordial level of sensory contents. Or conversely, he might begin, begin at the level of object constitution and then move upward into discussions of the different levels of intersubjective uh, experience. So from starting at the active level and then moving up to the personal level and then the intersubjective community. This can be confusing to the reader, as his passage from one level to the next is often unannounced. And even more problematic, we find the same terms, such as association or affectivity, even objectivity or materiality, being applied at each level. However, their meaning changes subtly with each move according to the shift of his analyses. And sometimes he actually re redefines the term. So in work that I've done in the past, we see him working th through the notion of association. He redefines it uh, several times. And if you pay attention, he's actually redefining it according to a different level. This leads not just to confusion, but it also gives the impression that Husserl is equivocating between multiple definitions of the same term or that he might be contradicting himself when in fact he is not. So I've done um, quite a bit of sort of technical work with Husserl's texts. I'm not going to do that here. We can talk about that uh, later. Um, in another version of this paper, I, I show how in the fifth Cartesian meditation, Husserl is actually explicitly moving from one level to the other. Not totally explicitly though, because he doesn't actually say I'm moving from one level to the other. Um, but his terminology shifts very much so. Um, and the, du the direction of his gaze seems to shift with him. I would like to turn now to a concrete example, that of eating disorders, in order to work through how these phenomenological levels of constitution function in everyday experiences. My argument in this section, however, is not merely that the levels of constitution are important for phenomenological projects, but rather that these phenomenological levels can be extremely useful for projects in other disciplines, such as psychology, sociology, gender studies, and critical theories of race. Given the interests of many con contributors at this conference, my example of eating disorders here will be both phenomenological and therapeutic in nature. But because I am not an expert in therapeutic approaches, I do ask for your indulgence in my errors or any errors that I might make. My goal is not to overturn any approaches already in place in other disciplines. I wish merely to introduce a nuanced perspective that might, first of all, offer a way to gain deeper understandings of phenomena in a variety of areas, and second, present a rubric wherein multiple approaches to an issue, approaches themselves that might appear to contradict, can be seen in their relation to each other in such a way that they might be able to work together. So allow me to begin with the highest level of constitution, the level of intersubjective community, generations, and history. Plenty of work has been done to reveal the historical connection between body shape, especially thinness and beauty. Susan Bordeaux, this is several decades ago, in her Slender's bo Slender Bodies, for example, describes these connections as well as draws links between work ethic, asceticism, 
and self-control on the one hand, and consumerism and lack of self-control on the other. So the fact that discourses or the discourses of our community play a role in eating disorders has already been well established. So, uh, Susan Bordeaux uses an awful lot of Foucault in her work as well, which is why the, the connection between discourse and eating disorders is established. The individual who develops an eating disorder is surrounded by attitudes, both in the general atmosphere of society and in specific discourses and images, so you can talk about media images, that they take up into themselves. I take attitudes about bodies, about specific types of bodies, about beauty and thinness or fatness, and about self-control, and I relate them to my understanding of attractiveness, likability, success, etc. These attitudes become part of how I think, implicit in my decisions, and more importantly, they become integrated into my embodiment and habits, into my comportment, gestures, and behaviors. How my body is constituted, both by others and by myself, is influenced, or guided, or filtered, by the community, attitudes, discourses, and images that are, surround us. Thus, these attitudes become part of how I live my body. Husserl himself recognizes the importance of intersubjective discourse in how I experience myself and my embodiment. In his analyses in Ideas 2, he demonstrates that my body only truly becomes an objective material body through intersubjective constitution. When I encounter other subjects, I recognize them not only as other subjects like myself, but also as subjects who see me in the same way as they see objects in the world. Just as our mutual co-constitution engenders the objectivity of objects in the world and of the world itself, so this is an extended argument that Husserl works out in Ideas 2. This co-constitution also folds back onto my own body and it becomes con my body becomes constituted like other objects in the world. In other words, when we co-constitute the world and its objects as there for everyone, as material, only then does my body appear as a material object. So this is something Husserl explicitly says in Ideas 2. I've worked with this uh, quite a bit with regard to the constitution of gender or gendered embodiment. In this way, and only through the constitution of other subjects, I am able to constitute my body as an objective thing. So I can only understand my own body as objective once I have been in relation with other subjects. As Husserl explains, he says, uh, the solipsistic subject could indeed have over against itself an objective nature. However, this subject could not apprehend itself as a member of nature, could not apperceive itself as psychophysical subject, as animal, the way this does happen on the intersubjective level of experience. So we can have some kind of rudimentary sense of, obje of an objective world just because material objects are not the same as my body, but I only understand my body as sort of a part of nature or as an objective thing once I encounter other subjects. Thus it seems clear that this higher intersubjective level is essential to how I understand my body. It is the ground for the embodiment, or it is the ground for my embodiment as material and it provides much context and even content to how I interpret my embodiment in relation to those around me. And this is demonstrated not only in Husserl's phenomenological work, but also, as we mentioned above, in other studies as well. So an awful lot of feminist work and queer theory um, uh, finds discourse uh, to be uh, essential to my experience of my embodiment. Um, and so my work on uh, in gendered and sexual embodiment uh, addresses this and demonstrates that Husserl also makes this argument. Um, so my argument is that phenomenology can also enter into these discussions. But Husserl offers um, the other perspectives of all these other layers, whereas many of the arguments in gender studies um, see the embodiment as purely discursive and don't uh, engage any of the other levels, or they argue all of those levels are purely discursive. And I do take, I take issue with that. But eating disorders are not solely grounded at this higher intersubjective level, for it cannot explain why certain individuals develop, develop such conditions and others do not. Our intersubjective community provides a context and filter that, make, that can make eating disorders possible, and in some cases can even drive forward certain occasions of eating disorders. Nevertheless, we know that there are many people for whom merely this context is not enough to lead to an eating disorder. <coughs> 
Thus, if we were to analyze eating disorders only from the perspective of attitudes of the general community, we would leave many questions unanswered, especially with regard to how different individuals manifest eating disorders in different ways, and how some cases can become much more extreme than others. For this reason, we move to the next level down. That of the first lower level of intersubjectivity. My relations of individual per two individual persons and concrete groups of individuals. So this is the level of uh, sort of individual person, personal relations. The people around me usually partake in and reinforce the discourses flowing through our social institutions, if we follow a Foucauldian analysis. But they can also voice counter discourses that challenge predominant and hegemonic discourses. This is also a Fugodian position. Thus, how individuals in my life express the discourses relating to my embodiment will have a concrete effect on how I, how I constitute my embodiment for myself. If I have important people in my life, for example, who take a critical stance to attitudes concerning beauty and body shape, this can influence whether and how I take up these general attitudes about my body. If I have influential people who emulate these attitudes, striving, for example, for thinness and beauty in word and deed, then this will affect me as well. It may affect me in opposite ways. That's another thing. It may make me follow them and may make me act against it. Alternately, if those around me are controlling or encourage perfectionism, asceticism, or a very strong work ethic, I can absorb these attitudes and translate them to a control of my body. Husserl himself gives an example of how individuals around me can affect how I see myself. Speaking of a hypothetical situation where an individual exists alone and constitutes the world as an isolated individual and then suddenly encounters several others, <clears throat> he concludes, as I communicate my, to my companions my earlier lived experiences, and they become aware of how much these conflict with their world, constituted intersubjectively and continuously exhibited by, a means, by means of a harmonious exchange of experiences, then I become for them an interesting pathological object. And they call my actuality so beautifully manifest to me the hallucination of someone who up to this point in time has been mentally ill. <coughs> Excuse me. I love this passage. Um, it says so much about um, sort of historical, psychological, and medical attitudes about all sorts of different types of people. I think it's much more insightful than even Husserl realizes. Interestingly, this description by Husserl points not only to the power that other individuals have in how I and my body are constituted, but also to the power of the therapist in the therapeutic situation. My body is objectified by others in my everyday life, and it is objectified in new ways in a clinical situation. A therapist would need to recognize both the importance of other individuals in her parents' life and her own position as an interlocutor with a certain authority. <clears throat> However, Husserl's description also shows how individuals with eating disorders might constitute meanings for themselves in, relation, in relative isolation. Having taken, by having taken, a, excuse me, by having taken certain social meanings to an extreme, people with eating disorders can live both within and outside of common social discourse. For all of these reasons, analyses of a person's relations with others is useful, even necessary, when counseling a person with an eating disorder. But it also points to how the therapeutic situation is an intersubjective relation as well with his own sets of discourses and manners of constituting the patient's embodiment. Husserl's phenomenological analyses of embodiment highlights the importance of every intersubjective encounter in how I constitute myself and my embodiment. But within the context of phenomenological levels of constitution, we will notice that individual relations with others appear in a new light when they also reflect the higher level of intersubjective community. It makes a difference, in other words, whether a therapist focuses on a patient's relation with a controlling mother or whether the patient's relation with a controlling mother is examined in the context of a society that values thin thinness as an aesthetic. Each of these levels, further, are in play as the individual constitutes her own embodiment in relation to thinness. <clears throat> 
In this way, not only is Husserl's work at this specific level useful, revealing the importance of other subjects and even the therapist and how a patient's embodiment can be constituted, but his recognition that embodiment is constituted through multiple levels at once can also provide layers of context that offer further insights and depth. So you could choose to work just at one level, or this one I would say probably is the typical therapeutic level, but if you take this and, and, and sort of consciously stay aware of the influence of one level to the other, and also pay attention to that, that this level is paying attention, then you have sort of a deeper uh, type of analysis. But this is still not the whole picture. <clears throat> My own flow of experiences, retained and rec recollected, provides a perspective from which I mediate and interpret the, those meanings and with which I come into contact. This is not to say that I can access intersubjective meanings from an objective viewpoint. Even if I isolate my own, myself in my own meaning construction, I engage with intersubjective meanings from the basis of my own history. My own history and my own experiences give me a distinct perspective. From that perspective, my own experiences may or may not resonate with the meanings I encounter from my community and other uh, individuals. I am called to respond to any dissonance. In some cases, my re response might be to establish my own world of meaning, despite the consequences. But however I respond, the context of my own experiential history is an essential ground from which I constitute any meaning. My constitution of my body, therefore, is not just an act of absorbing and living out the intersubjective discourses that surround me, whether from my community or other individuals, but it is also an engagement from my own perspective. For this reason, a therapeutic approach to eating disorders must attend to an individual's history and how that individual person engages with intersubjective meanings. In fact, recognizing the distinction between the inner subjective levels and this level of individual constitution can also assist in responding sympathetically when a patient is dealing with the tension of multiple con con constitutions of her embodiment. So you have a person who, for example, might think that they're fat, everybody else says that they're thin, you have two discourses. So rather than, say, choosing one side or the other as a therapist, the recognition that there's more than one discourse going on and that the individual person is actually engaging in multiple discourses in different ways um, might give a, a new perspective and a new uh, a way to approach. <clears throat> in fact, this level of active constitution is a central point at which intersubjective meanings of embodiment overlap with my own sensory embodiment. As I constitute my embodiment, I may highlight intersubjective meanings or sensory input I may find that they integrate with one another or that they conflict. I may push certain aspects into the background, remaining relatively unaware of them, while I bring others to the fore. How I carry this out, however, depends on the discourses that I absorb from my inner subjective context, my own engagement with meaning, and on the sensory input and patterns of experience already embedded in my own experience. Husserl gives an example wherein a person in a situation of doubt may actually decide in favor of a belief that contradicts his experiences because of the strength of that belief. This is in the analyses of passive synthesis very early on. So he's talking about doubt. Uh, and, he, and there's this one sentence where he says, well, I'm, you know, I'm paying attention to the evidence. I'm searching out the evidence, and that will help me decide whether this is one thing or another. On occasion, I may just believe that it's one thing. And even if the evidence shows me to the contrary, I may actually choose for that belief. So he recognizes that certain mindsets can actually influence what kind of decisions we make in spite of the actual um, sort of concrete sensory evidence that we might have. For Husserl, then, both the belief systems within which we live, which correspond to intersubjective discourses, and the sensory evidence directly experienced are in play when we constitute our current experiences. With this, we move to the next level of passive synthesis. Here we find not only the synthesis of all meaning that has been constituted through the higher levels, but also syntheses of patterns of behavior, habits, and decisions. So this is where I think embodiment really comes into play, though of course it's already in play at all of the levels. Embodiment gains depth at this level, since here we, under, here we see how patterns become ingrained, how decisions from our past affect our current engagement with objects, and so on. This level of passive synthesis is important in an analysis of eating, analysis of eating disorders. 
Eating disorders do not appear fully formed. Rather, they develop through repeated actions. They become ingrained into bodily movement as well as manners of perceiving, thinking, and behaving. A person with an eating disorder might develop revulsions to certain types of food, for example, or establish rituals surrounding meals, exercise, or measuring their, their size or weight. These begin as momentary actions or reactions, but they are subsequently repeated in such a way that they become part of the individual's of part of the individual, embedded in her style of behavior, the means through which she relates to the world and her own embodiment. They become meaningful for themselves. Husserl describes a similar situation well. There arises some sensuous drive, for example, the urge to smoke. I reach for a cigar and light it up, whereas my attention, my ego attack activities, are entirely somewhere else. The ego always lives with the medium of its history. In all its, all its earlier lived experiences have sunk down, but they have after effects in tendencies, sudden ideas, transformations or assimilations of earlier lived experiences. And from such assimilation, and from such assimilations, new formations are merged together, etc. <clears throat> Husserl is describing embodied habits, habits that I carry out even when I am not paying attention to them. They are part of my history sedimented in my embodiment and they are connected and yet they are connected to what I do now and how I constitute the world in myself. Here it becomes clear that a straightforward analysis of say intersubjective attitudes about beauty and thinness would probably not suffice in treating someone with an eating disorder. For the embodied practices of sedimented, for the embodied practices sedimented in passive synthesis Practices that affect not only the physical body, but also the thought processes and sensory perception of the individual are fundamental to the disorder itself. Conversely, addressing only the ritual behavior, the habits, or the embedded patterns of perception and decisions of an, of an individual, without, ignore, excuse me, without acknowledging the importance of social context and relations with others, does not address the, fun, does not address the phenomenon to its fullest extent either. At this level, the body has its own history, a history sedimented into muscle movement, into involuntary reactions to odors and textures, into desires and revulsions. But this history is integrated with the meanings found at the higher phenomenological levels. Full analyses must therefore address each individual level, as well as how the levels relate to one another. Finally, we turn to the lowest level of hyletic flow, where we find primordial sensory experience. We have our original moments of sensory content. Here we have original moments of sensory content, including not only the traditional five senses, but also such feelings as nausea, pain, pleasure, and tension. This is something that Husserl addresses specifically in Ideas 2. Although the hyletic flow is simply a flow of pure sensation, or at least one aspect of the hyletic flow, Already here, <clears throat> certain sensory content may be highlighted or primordially associated, and as such, it is set apart from other content. So here we already sort of see two levels within the hyletic flow. Sensations of nausea, for example, associate primordially with one another, distinguishing themselves from, say, the color of red, the sound of a ticking clock, or pain in my toe. Now that doesn't mean I can't also have associations between things. So if I experience nausea and the clock is ticking really loudly, then a week later when I hear the clock ticking loudly, I may remember that experience of nausea or feel, start feeling nauseous again. Husserl talks about those types of associations as well. Given this, the level of hyletic flow can be said to have more than one layer within itself, as we've been saying. The pure sensory flowing is the ultimate ground and the flow of primordially associated sensory contents rises up from the ground. In addition, the primordial level also contains imminent temporalities or the flow, uh, original flow of inner time consciousness. It is here then that sensory contents are originally taken up as primordially associated and in temporal constitution. <clears throat> this is also the most fundamental level of embodiment. The sensations arising from the body distinguish themselves from the sensations of other objects because of their double sensations, so the sensation of sensing oneself while also uh, sensing something else. These double sensations are sensations that come from feeling one's own body externally in touch 
and internally in movement and location, also known as, uh, often described as proprioception. The sensory content of embodied constitution therefore originates at this level. The embodiment of a person with an eating disorder will similarly have a phenomenological basis in such sensory content, but certain patterns established through passive synthesis can act to highlight or cover over aspects of the sensory flow. Hunger may be covered over, for example, while revulsion or desire may leap to the forefront. Husserl himself, in an earlier citation that, we just, that I just read, describes the urge to smoke as a sensuous drive, but also as a sensuous drive that he does not notice because he is occupied with other things. These sensory experiences remain at the root of my experience even as a person develops patterns of behavior to avoid or respond to specific sensory experiences. The covered over sensations remain, in other words, but precisely as covered over. When a person develops new opposing patterns, the habit of covering over certain sensations might then be counteracted, at least to some extent. A person recovering from an eating disorder, for example, might once again feel hunger, hunger pangs or may overcome the revulsion or desire for certain foods. <clears throat> At this level then, the body has its own voice in elementary sensory experiences, but it is a voice to which we can turn or one that we can ignore. It can be covered over by habits, contrary meaning constitution or discursive meanings established by interpersonal others or the general community. Each of these levels of constitution, of meaning, relates to the others, influencing them, reacting to them, and negotiating with them. They filter upward and downward into each other. Thus, a phenomenological approach, and I would argue also a therapeutic one, is most fully carried out when it attends to the different constitutions of meaning at each level, as well as their relations to one another. So I've been talking about each level separately, and I'll put it up on the... Um, There we go. Um, <clears throat> oops, that's not, okay. Um, if I'm talking about the different levels separately, but actually they each bleed into one another. So um, intersubjective discourses can then affect how I uh, um, constitute meaning about my own body, can also then influence how my sensory uh, content is taken up, but also it can go upward as well. So sensory contents that can then go and either substantiate uh, certain intersubjective uh, experiences or they can counteract or challenge them uh, depending on how I take them up myself. All right. So most therapists who counsel patients with eating disorders, I assume, already implicitly recognize these several phenomenological levels of constitution. So in one sense, I don't think I've actually given you anything new here. All, anyone who's dealing with uh, uh, therapy or ther therapeutic situations is well aware that there are multiple uh, uh, levels with which you're dealing with any type of patient. Um, but perhaps outlining these levels, as I have done here, might offer a rubric from which deeper analyses could be carried out at different levels. And further, the constitution of meaning at one level can be re recognized in its relation to and influence upon other levels. So what I've hope hopefully done is sort of um, distinguish these levels so that if you wanted to, you could then focus on one level for a patient and stay there for a while. So linger there to work through the issues at that level or take a step back and sort of work at, with multiple levels at once. We are always experiencing through all of these levels at once but from a phenomenological perspective, we can examine how the meanings constituted at one level can filter into the others, whether we are following the trajectory downward from, say, let's see, we got, there we go, the review, um, my inner subjective constitution uh, into sen sensory embodiment, or upward from rudimentary sensation into individual and then intersubjective meaning constitution. Thus, we can carry out specific analyses at any single level achieving a deeper understanding of the experience and constitution of meaning that takes place there, and we can carry out analyses that focus upon the relations between the levels and how the phenomenon is constituted through multiple levels at once. Recognizing these levels of constitution and their relations offers insight into specific types of experience and flexibility and in how, and in how we analyze them. A further benefit to this rubric is the following. Recognizing so we we'll go back. Uh, recognizing that there are multiple levels of experience could give a therapist more flexibility as to how to approach a specific individual with an eating disorder. With an eating disorder. 
Since each individual has their own embodiment, history, and their own constitution of intersubjective meaning, how one treats a specific individual might depend on how that person takes up meaning. One's approach might differ depending on whether, for example, intersubjective discourses are given priority in that person's narrative rather than patterns of behavior. From that point, the therapy can then turn to other levels depending upon the conversation between the therapist and the patient. If nothing else, it provides multiple perspectives on an individual case, thus offering different avenues of approach. That was my last sentence. Thank you.